What do you make of that very depressing, that very depressing uh, stat of if your parents are obese, you're overwhelmingly likely to be obese too? Yeah. So great question. And this is kind of my wheelhouse. And I will say that research was drastically misrepresented. Yes. If On you 60 have minutes. Old parents who are overweight or obese, you are 80% likely to be overweight or obese yourself. But the idea that that's genetics, there are genetic components to obesity. Most of them tend to be on the appetite side of things. For example, people who are overweight or obese, uh, they tend to not have as great of a satiety signal uh, from the foods they eat. They get a greater reward from the foods they eat compared to like your average person. And so there are some genetic components to that. But when you look at, when you unpack genetics, um, you know, our genetics didn't shift in a generation. And the reality is obesity is basically a one or two generation problem. Before 1950, it's not that it didn't exist, but it was very, very minimal. Uh, and now we have almost half the population. So our genetics didn't change in that period of time. Uh, what happened, if you look at the research, is people began eating more calories and doing less physical activity. Now, uh, genetics really only loads up the gun for obesity. It's kind of behavior and lifestyle that pulls the trigger. But we do live in an environment where, you know, we have access to highly palatable, hyper-processed foods. And it's much easier to overeat now than even, say, in the 1950s when you had things like baked goods and, what, baked goods and whatnot. But you had to walk to a store. You had to cook them yourself. It was much higher barrier to entry. So mm. this idea... This idea that 80% of uh, people, that it's a genetic thing, um, the research doesn't show that. In fact, if you look at people who are overweight or obese and you look at their, their metabolic rate, if anything, they have a higher metabolic rate than people who are lean. Now, a lot of that is explained by the fact that obese people have a higher overall body weight, so they have a higher metabolic rate just to pull around all that tissue. But when mm -hmm. even when you standardize for their lean mass, they have at least the same metabolic rate as people who are lean. And so this idea that it's genetics, yes, there are some things on the appetite side, but this idea that obese people have like slower metabolisms and whatnot, while you can have people with like thyroid problems and, and, and those sorts of issues that can slow metabolic rate, on a population level, genetics don't really explain the differences at least in terms of metabolic rate and energy expenditure, but mm -hmm. there is some data that it may impact the time. I feel like, uh, you know, I definitely have a long line of overweight people in my family. My mom loves it when I talk about this. Um, but can I tell you, I don't feel like I suffer from an, a never ending urge to eat. I feel like if anything makes me overeat, this, this may sound weird, but it's like an oral fixation. Like, you know, I need to be like sipping on something or eating something or I don't know, but it's like very gratifying to be like eating or drinking something, even if I'm not hungry or thirsty. Well, and so what's very interesting is a lot of people get really hung up on hunger and appetite and they say, well, this diet, for example, ketogenic diet reduces hunger or intermittent fasting reduces hunger or all these different things. And at the end of the day, by the way, none of these diets come out any better for long-term weight loss. They all have approximately the same statistics. Um, individual diets may be better for certain individuals. If, for example, you like intermittent fasting and you just find it easy to stick to, that's a great reason to do it. Uh, but it, it doesn't really come out as being better than like regular continuous calorie restriction. But, you know, the, the problem is so much of this stuff gets washed up in all the messaging that it's difficult to pick it apart. And one of the things I'll tell people is hunger isn't the only reason people eat. People eat for a lot more reasons than hunger. I mean, think about the last time you went to a social event that didn't have food. There's mm -hmm. so many different cues. There's social cues. There's psychological cues. Some people end up eating as a comfort due to stress. Some people end up not yeah. eating when they're stressed. So it's very, very different. And I think hunger is a big part of it. In fact, the uh, GLP-1 memetics, the last doctor was talking about, um, the reason they work is because they cause you to eat less. So they don't increase your metabolic rate. They don't turn you into a magical fat burning machine. You just have a less appetite and you eat less, which is a, is a great mm -hmm. thing. And I think that they're great drugs with a lot of promise. Um, 
But I think a lot of people get hung up on the idea of, oh, something's going to turn us into just like fat melting machines. And a lot of it's just on the consumption side. But appetite isn't the only reason that we even see this in people who have gastric bypass. Some people will like hack their way around gastric bypass by consuming more liquid calories or whatever it may be. So at the end mm. of the day, these drugs, uh, gastric bypass, a lot of what's happening is it's just kind of forcing you into lifestyle changes by causing you to consume less energy. What do you make of my uh, approach on the days I really need to go hardcore on my intermittent fasting? Because, you know, normally I'll I'll have my coffee and I'll, I'll have heavy cream in my coffee, which I, I think is okay. Um, and a little bit of sugar, not much, but I'll have some. In any event, if I go hardcore, then I won't have like a handful of berries or sometimes I'll have a, like a very small snack. If I'm hardcore, I don't do that stuff, but I will have a Diet Coke. And yeah. I asked my doctor about it because he likes intermittent fasting. And I said, and he was like, it's fine. And I was like, well, isn't it, isn't it supposed to be very controversial? Like the diet soda and he said, it's no worse than following the number 17 bus for a, a block down the, <laughs> down the street when, on your feet. Like it's fine. What do you think about that? This is actually something I talk about quite a bit and kind of known for. Um, so I think there's a very large pushback against artificial things just due to this naturalism fallacy that it's something that's natural must be better for us. And indeed, like whole foods kind of as nature intended them are very satisfying. They uh, have less calories. They're more difficult to overconsume. But people take that logic and extend it way too far. And diet soda has actually been shown to be a pretty powerful weight loss tool. So in research studies where they have people take sugar sweetened beverages like regular soda and replace it with diet soda, they see weight loss. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in one study, they actually did a comparison of uh, sugar sweetened beverage replaced with water or sugar sweetened beverage replaced with diet soda. This was a, what's called a network meta-analysis, which is a very large study. Um, and they found that diet soda, or they refer to it as low calorie sweetened beverage, but essentially the same thing actually performed better than water. Now diet soda isn't like a fat burner or anything like that, but what it indicates is people just end up eating less because they're getting that sweet satisfaction somewhere else. So I've been talking about the amazing extreme altitude wines from the Bonner private wine partnership because they're back they're back with an amazing offer from my audience. It's winter, of course, and these flavors happen to go great with any hearty meal and meat that you may be serving. They're unlike any wine that you've ever tasted. Blackberry, leather, smoke, little dark cherry in there. Don't you love dark cherry? It makes everything better. The wines are almost impossible to get on your own. The producers deep in the Andes Mountains make limited quantities. Today, I have an amazing offer that I've never had before. If you visit Bonner, B-O-N-N-E-R, privatewines.com slash M-K-S, you will not only get wine for over 50% off, plus free shipping, you will also get a bonus bottle of small batch limited production wine from their exclusive wine cellar. That's four bottles for the price of three. It's a deal that's hard to turn down if you're a wine lover like I am. They've cut out the middleman, so you're not going to pay a big markup. You just visit Bonner, B-O-N-N-E-R, privatewines.com slash M-K-S to claim your bonus bottle and become a part of America's most unique wine club. Try these wines and see for yourself. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.